Hi guys, Dane here, and uh, yeah, I'm literally picking up from my last reading vlog. So, as you may remember, I'm literally right at the end of Strange Weather by Joe Hill. I'm in the afterword. I've got like three pages to go or something. Uh, and I'm currently watching Spartacus and making uh, a, a curry, a spinach and tofu curry. So, I'm going to go and serve that now. All right. Here it is. Here it is, the final result. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to go and join a Roman picnic, by which we mean we're going to go and beat up some Romans. Yeah! I have reached the intermission. <laughs> this evening we're watching The Mummy. And he's flopped, haven't you? Oh! Hello! It's I've still got this thing on my face, I know it's terrible. But look at the floor, it's kind of hoovered because I got my new hoover. End of story. Um, it is Thursday, Thursday the 30th of May. I had a driving lesson earlier, it seemed to go okay. Um, yeah, I did one thing that would have failed me. I failed to stop on a stop line. My bad. But uh, apart from that it went well and I did the big roundabout without getting too scared. So there's... <laughs> So there's that. Um, at the end, or at the start of this vlog, and at the end of my last one, I just finished reading Strange Weather by Joe Hill. So I'm not going to talk about that here because I talked about it in my last vlog, and also it's in my My Cat Picked My TBR video. I do have some other stuff though, so I'll update you on these. Uh, well, I finished reading this in bed last night, uh, The Atheist Mass by uh, Honorary Balsack. No, uh, Honoré de Balzac, I think is how you pronounce the name. Two devastating stories of faith and sacrifice from Balzac's panorama of 19th century French life, comma, space, stop. They need to do some quality control on that. Look at that. <laughs> um, this is Penguin Little Black Classic number 41. And uh, I'll give this like a 3 out of 5. The writing was okay. It kind of took me a while to get used to the style. There's also a lot of footnotes which kind of annoyed me. Because I, d I don't know, I didn't, I didn't really need the information that was in the footnotes, if that makes sense. Uh, I don't, I'm not against footnotes on principle, but I just didn't enjoy the ones in this one. Here we have the atheist mass and the conscript. I, I guess I preferred the conscript a little bit more. Uh, both of them kind of deal with like ethics and stuff like that. Um, like you would think that you know the atheist mass that it's going to be like a big sort of religious feeling piece and there are, there are like religious themes to it but that's not really what it's about it is more about morality I think they're both about morality and kind of why people do things that are against the rules or that they wouldn't normally do that sort of thing but yeah it, it was just a bit a bit slow okay uh, then we have uh, the official screenplay to Roald Dahl's Fantastic Mr. Fox by Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach uh, I don't know if I've actually seen this movie. I've definitely read the book and I was reading this screenplay and I was like, not only do I not remember seeing this in the movie, but this is definitely not how the book goes. They basically took the the idea of the book, but not kept any of the plot points, you know? And I mean, I guess that might work for some people. I can see why it would work for kids, but I don't know. It was a disappointment reading this. I haven't actually written my review for it yet, but I'm probably gonna give it like a two out of five. It just, I, pref I much prefer the original. And I don't see why they didn't just follow the story of the original and just there was a lot of humor I didn't like in it like the characters kept swearing But they'd swear with the word cuss so like the dad would be to his son like go and get me that cussing spanner And I'm just like oh, please stop. It's just cringy So yeah, sorry Wes Anderson then I have uh, Terry Pratchett's Small Gods, a Discworld graphic novel adapted by Ray Friesen. And uh, this is really beautifully uh, illustrated as well. And very well, like, it's a very good representation of how the Discworld works and everything. It, you could read this as a standalone and it would be a pretty good introduction to Discworld. I'm actually going to recommend this uh, to Bex, my girlfriend, because she's really into graphic novels. Uh, Friesen, the uh, illustrator, he, I, I think he made this after Pratchett had passed away, but he did meet Pratchett. Uh, we have a photo here of, uh, so this is Terry Pratchett, uh, Ray Friesen, and then Rob, Ge uh, no, not Rob Geary, um, Rob Wilkins, that's it, who is uh, Pratchett's business manager. And he's still, like, Rob still kind of runs things now as well. So this is really Ray and Rob have sort of brought this together based on Pratchett's material. But, you know, you can tell there's a really loving touch to the way they've done it. And they've just, they've really done it justice here. A lot of fun. And 
it was for me it was like being able to reread the novel without committing myself to rereading the novel i should point out here as well the kind of the plot of this um i'm gonna read you the plot actually why not in the beginning was the word and the word was hey you this is the discord after all and religion is a controversial business everyone has their own opinions and their own gods all elbowing for space at the top in such a competitive situation, it's not exactly helpful to be reduced to the form of a tortoise, a shape far below godlike status in anyone's book. The great god Om, tortoise, needs followers, and fast. Brother, the novice, is his chosen one, or at least the only one available. He wants peace and justice and brotherly love. He also wants the Inquisition to stop torturing him now, please. Follow the misadventures of Om and Brother in fully illustrated form for the first time in this new adaptation of Terry Pratchett's best-selling novel. Yeah, uh, four out of five for me. I mean, it's not my favourite Discworld novel, so it was always going to struggle a little bit, but um, I think I enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the novel back in the day, but then again, I mean, I probably picked up on some more of the themes. There was also a great piece of Latin in there. Poius testiculus habeas, habeus cardia e cerebellum. And I believe in the manuscript, he, he uh, defined that as meaning something like uh, when you have their full attention, you have their hearts and minds. But literally translated, it means when you have them by the balls, you have their hearts and minds. So I like that. That was cool. And now I'm currently reading Dumb Witness by Agatha Christie. So I'm about, I'm on page about 150 of about 400. And I started this last night. I'll probably finish this tomorrow night. Enjoying it so far. It's a Poirot novel. What is it? It's sort of... Well, it's about 15th, something like that. Everyone blamed Emily's accident on a rubber ball left on the stairs by their frisky terrier. But the more she thought about her fall, the more convinced she became that one of her relatives was trying to kill her. On April 17th, she wrote her suspicions in a letter to Hercule Poirot. Mysteriously, he didn't receive the letter until June 28th, by which time Emily was already dead. And it, yeah, it was quite cool because I think there's an intro as well where Christy kind of or even I think it was just a dedication and she dedicates it to like her family dog. And uh, I, I like this idea of the dog is the witness you know so yeah that's where i'm at i've been busy with work and stuff i've got another driving lesson tomorrow other than that i literally i haven't really left the house i went to the shop the other day that was nice um i'm on the radio this evening so i'll probably take the camera along there and do like a little time lapse and uh, i can link below to to some of that as well and yeah other than that i'm gonna do a bit more filming so yeah wish me luck Oh, there we go. We're in focus and we're in the light. Uh, I'm in Oxford. Bex is down here. It's just putting her makeup on, putting your face on. Uh, we did we did some role playing earlier, didn't we? We did. We played Ministry. I'll link to Ministry below because that's that's nice. Help yeah. spread the message. Yeah, should, everyone should play. Yeah, everyone should play. So Bex, you play it once a week. Once a week. Every once a week every Wednesday. So we had a little. A little introductory session so uh, so I was my own character I was being uh, George uh, Madison that's the one doesn't really matter it's not actually his name nobody knows my name well I know my name he's a very mysterious character yeah he is a mysterious character did, did you enjoy meeting him I did yeah did you enjoy meeting George well I yeah. didn't I did but I don't know my character oh no your character probably didn't well I don't know he helped <laughs> hey, I shot I shot one person in the shoulder and another person in the kneecap that was good yeah Lots of shooting, and then I ran away from the police. I've got grey hair in my beard. Is that grey? Is that grey or blonde? Yeah, I'm still filming. Hello. Hey, Kitty. What's your name? Hello. What's your name? Oh, a very content cat. Oh, little spider. It's gone. Hmm. No. They just, they're just going to look at me. It's Sunday morning coming down, as Johnny Johnny Cash would say. Mmm. Beautiful. Look at that. It's got covered in crisp now. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. Look at that. You're a uh, crisp falafel wrap. <laughs> what else you got in it? You got that's uh, um, all different like um, quinoa. Yeah, beetroot, beetroot, avocado, avocado peppers, crisps, um, tomatoes, yeah. falafel. Mm. Your homemade falafel, a bit in there. Your homemade um, hummus. Yeah, homemade mm -hmm. hummus. And what what am I enjoying here? You're enjoying um, 
sweet potato um, tagine. Sweet potato tagine. With, um, it's got a bit of cauliflower in there mm. and lots of different spices. It's got some apricot in there, not it? Apricot as well, tagine um, is mm -hmm. It's got some, um, uh, what's it, some chickpeas? Harissa. Harissa, yep. yeah, Harissa, and then topped with uh, spring onions, chilies, sea salt, and cracked black pepper. Oh, looks mm. good. Okay, I'm going in. I'm my Rubicon, my fizzy Rubicon, and my Joe Hill. Aloha! I am back at home now, as you can tell from the sofa. Someone's making noise on Netflix for some reason. I was thinking the other day, well, maybe I might consider, I've got a green screen over there, right? But it's crap, basically. Like, it's trans, you can see through to the, there are things like, there are things on the wall behind it and you can see through it. And it's just hard to get the camera set up and my lighting and all this stuff. But I could theoretically get a pop-up green screen to go behind the sofa. And then in like, in my videos, I'd be sitting on the sofa, but then I could control what was behind the sofa, if that makes sense. So I might do that when I've got some money, because at the moment I don't have any money. In fact, note to editing Dane, make a note to do that when you have some money. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm back from Oxford. So yesterday we did some role playing, which was a lot of fun. And then in the evening we went to a pub called the Isis, which is just by the river, the river Isis. Um, and yeah, it was Bex's boss's 60th birthday party. Uh, I hadn't met him before, but I knew a few people there. So like enough that like I wasn't tied to her side or anything so like we sort of you know as you're going around and chatting in groups and stuff so I could mingle quite well because there were there was always like at least two and sometimes like three four groups where I knew at least one of the people there you know so um so that was nice had a few drinkies and yeah the role playing was really good actually uh, another thing I want to do is send a little sort of thank you to the guy organizing it uh, so I got to play my fictional character which was fun and yeah, he's looking for people to be like game masters and basically host it. And Bex might, well, she's probably one of the best people to do it because she's quite experienced with the game, so she knows it. But I'd also be quite interested in doing it because um, it's quite kind of a storytelling thing, you know? I think it's almost, to me, I think I'd be more interested in running it than playing one of the characters, if that makes sense. But um, I don't know. I'll have a think about it. Uh, this is a game called Ministry. I'll link to it below. I think I've already said all this. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd update you on some books. So before I left, I read The Meek One by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is Penguin Little Black Classic number 44. Based on a St. Petersburg news report, Dostoevsky's searing tale of a man who drives his wife to suicide. And what was done really well here is this, this man who is telling the story and he's so clueless. He's absolutely clueless. He doesn't even realise that he drove her to suicide, which kind of adds this level of irony because he's talking about stuff and you as the reader, you're like, I can understand this, you know? I can understand how she got to where, to, to where she got to. Uh, let me just mute my computer. So yeah, it was actually really well done. Um, a little bit overwritten, I think. And oh my God, one of the things throughout it, it was just, the, I, I don't know whether it's the translation from Russian and where it's not carried across very well. But the phrase, like a madman, was in this 60 page thing. I think it happened eight times, nine times. And like one of them was, <laughs> he, went, he went into his room, this room where his wife was sitting at a table. And uh, instead of sitting opposite her, he sat next to her like a madman. And it's like, I, I get that like the social tradition is that you, you sit opposite, but it's not like a madman to sit next to somebody. Unless, like, I don't know, unless madness in the 1800s was just, like, you know, people getting locked up for insanity because they didn't say thank you to the omnibus driver or something. I don't, I don't know. So, <laughs> they didn't leave a tip with their, uh, their handsome cab driver. I <laughs> they took the wrong kind of flowers to someone's dinner party. I don't... <laughs> Oh, I'm getting riled up about this. It's making me laugh, though. But apart from that, it was really well written. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think you can interpret it and read it in different ways. So the way I read it was basically, it was, a, it was a bit of like an arranged marriage kind of situation. He was 40, she was 16, but her parents wanted her to marry him because he had a little bit of money and a little bit of social standing. And um, basically, like, they weren't very close. They weren't physically close. And he would kind of do his thing. She would do hers. And then he realized that he loved her. And he sort of told her, like, I want us to do everything together. I want us to start again. I want us to do this and to do that. And that's not what she wanted. At least that was my reading of it. And that was the final straw for her where she, she might not have been super happy before, but she was happy in a way. And she got to be her own person. She got to do her own thing. 
And then by him realising that he loved her and wanting to, you know, be a proper husband and wife, that's what pushed her over the edge, because then she was like, well, the only thing... Yeah, basically, and then she was, like, really upset, because then she lost the only thing that was, that she, you know, she could express herself with. Anyway, then I read Dumb Witness by Agatha Christie. This is a Hercule Poirot book. I can read the blurb because it's quite short. Everyone blamed Emily's accident on a rubber ball left on the stairs by her frisky terrier. But the more she thought about her fall, the more convinced she became that one of her relatives was trying to kill her. On April 17th, she wrote her suspicions in a letter to Hercule Poirot. Mysteriously, he didn't receive the letter until June 28th, by which time Emily was already dead. So, my main thing I didn't like about this was um, I thought it was almost going to be a bit... You know, the whole curious incident of the, the dog that barked in the night time and what was curious was that the dog didn't bark. And I don't know, I, I thought it was almost going to be that the dog had seen something uh, and that that was going to play into it. But really, basically what it was was that, uh, yeah, they blamed that she they said she'd fallen over this rubber ball, but the dog was outside and the ball shouldn't have been where it was. And so the dog... You know what I mean? The dog wasn't a dumb witness, because the dog didn't witness anything. So I don't know where the title of this comes from, if that makes sense. I don't, it was very, uh, very odd. But I mean, the, the mystery itself was pretty good. Characterization pretty good. Story pretty good. Pretty much bog standard Christie. I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5. What did blow my mind is that Bex has got a copy of this as well, because basically I ordered one online, and then I also bought it in the charity shop without realising that I'd ordered it the day before somehow. So then I ended up with two editions, and mine's Harper, hers is Harper Collins, and uh, it's the same cover, but hers, I think, has got a slightly smaller font, slightly different layout, and might be bigger, because her edition's 320 pages, and mine's like 415 or something, so that confused me, because because of it being the same colour and the same publishers. So it's a different edition from the same publisher, which was... You know, a bit weird. But uh, yeah, 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 probably 3.75 out of 5 for that one. The Meek one was a 4 out of 5. And now I am reading Horns by Joe Hill. So actually, when I when I first got this, Bex basically pinched it from me. So she's already read it now. I'm getting towards the end. And then we're probably going to watch the movie together. And actually, let me, go, let me know if you want us to do a video together on that, of like both of our thoughts on the book and on the movie. Because she's a bit shy about pretend, about being on camera but another thing i thought that she could potentially do is like she could film me talking about it and talk from behind the camera because she's a bit more comfortable i think with that um but yeah let, let me know if you'd like a sort of combined review of the book and the movie from both of our points of view if that makes sense i am enjoying it so far joe hill's great uh, this is my fourth joe hill now or my third i think this month oh no because it's a new month because it's the start of june but my third in a month certainly because i read two towards the middle of last month. And uh, yeah, it's really good, really enjoying it. I like these sort of themes of good and evil. The plot is basically this guy wakes up one morning and he's got these horns and the horns kind of allow him to, well, people are really, they see him as their own demon or whatever. And so they start sharing their darkest thoughts and all this stuff and he can kind of manipulate them. Um, but then we also go back a lot to when he was a youngster and this girl that he was in love with was murdered and everyone thinks he did it and uh, yeah it's quite good. The only issue I have, so this is spoiler territory now, is I'm near the end, over two thirds of the way through and we've just discovered, like we already knew basically his brother told him that his mate as a kid um, was the one who was guilty. And, so, and then we're kind of going backwards and forwards through time and learning more about these characters and their relationships. But then, so I've, we've just got to the point where his brother's motivation is shared, which is that this guy tried to kind of frame him. And actually he left his brother's blood at the scene of the crime so that then he'd have this thing over him. But then Ig, the main character, he was arrested and they investigated it and they ran the evidence and they found that like forensically, no, he wasn't involved. But surely they would have tested the blood found at the crime scene against his blood. And they would have found, yeah, okay, they would have found it wasn't his blood. The DNA is different. But they would have found that it was a close family match and almost certainly one of his family members. So, in which case, if that happens, this entire plot wouldn't have happened because the police would have then focused in on his family. And I suspect his brother being the character that he, that he is, his brother would have told the truth. They might not have believed him, but his brother would have told the truth. And so this whole plot wouldn't be there. So it's kind of, a, for me, that's quite a big plot hole just because it's not addressed. I think they could have addressed it 
like maybe if they were saying like oh they didn't have the budget to run those tests or something but certainly in the time this was set the equipment and the like technical scientific capabilities was there so I, I don't know that's kind of bugged me a little bit since I read that part but yeah so far it's, it's on still on course to be like a four out of five I think so yeah that's where I'm at um I don't know if I've got enough for this vlog to to call it but you know what let's let's go ahead and call it because it's it's Sunday and we can get back to doing a weekly vlog and um yeah I mean I turned 30 in about 10 days as well so there's gonna be stuff there like next weekend we're off to Tamworth to see my mother so that'll be nice and that'll work out as like a well little well-rounded vlog plus I've just been talking way too much here so on that note I'm gonna love you and leave you so thanks as always for watching don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and I will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye